Welcome to CSIS. My name is Morgan Higman, and I am a fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program. I am so glad to be joined today by Representative Ann Williams of Illinois. Ann is the second uh, leader in our state leadership series this week. Uh, we'll be speaking to four states over the course of the next uh, couple of days. And um, this series is part of our Clean Resilient States Initiative, which is supported by the Sloan Foundation, and we are grateful for their support for this work. Representative Williams uh, is in her sixth term in Illinois. She represents the 11th district on Chicago's north side. She is the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee in Illinois, and she is the vice chair of the Ju Judiciary Civil Committee. Um, she is also the chief sponsor of the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which was integral to the passage of the Climate and Equity Jobs Act passed in September of 2021. Prior to her election, she worked as an assistant attorney in Illinois, supporting public interest agendas related to uh, preventing consumer fraud and encouraging openness and accountability in um, government. Representative Williams, thank you so much for joining us. Um, in Illinois, uh, you've got a lot of exciting climate and energy um, sort of progress being made. Um, I would like to talk, of course, about your uh, state's Climate and Equity Jobs Act. But before we get to the substance of that uh, legislation, I, I want to step back a little bit. Um, back in 2016, um, Illinois uh, advanced the Future Energy Jobs Act, which encouraged renewables and kept the state's nuclear power plants operating. Um, and then, of course, last year you had this seminal Climate and Equity Jobs Act, or CJA, as it has come to be known. Um, and uh, it is incredibly ambitious and also sort of worker friendly. Um, before we talk about the substance of that bill, I wondered if you could talk about sort of what changed in the last five years and what really led up to um, this new CJA sort of legislation. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. And I'm really excited to be here speaking with you today about one of my favorite topics. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, the short answer is FIJA was working. It was working so well that in order to accommodate all the investment opportunities and the companies wishing to locate and uh, build in Illinois, we had to expand the programming that we started almost as a seed in FIJA. And of course, within that short period of time from 2016 to when we introduced CJA originally in 2019, the uh, issue of climate change and the climate crisis was growing exponentially, both in terms of what we were seeing on the ground and in terms of the public interest in the topics. So it just seemed like the time was right to start having a conversation about how we could look at energy in a way that uh, addresses the very real and very uh, uh, epic <laughs> climate concerns. Very good. And CJA contains so many interesting provisions. It touches upon renewable energy deployment, um, the phase out of coal power plants, transportation and electric vehicles, labor and equity standards, workforce development and just transitions, consumer protections, and utility reforms, among so many other uh, topics. Um, I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the provisions that you think are most important in advancing Illinois' climate and energy goals. Well, I'd love to. There are, as you said, um, many, many uh, topics covered in uh, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. It's a very comprehensive piece of legislation, and that's what makes it so powerful, really, and nation leading. Of course, the uh, marquee, uh, the centerpiece uh, for me is the uh, moving us toward the uh, carbon-free future, a carbon-free power sector specifically. So the bill in a myriad of ways puts Illinois on a path to a 100% clean energy future by 2050 and delivers 100% carbon-free power by 2045. And at the beginning when the bill was first introduced, uh, that seemed like a lofty goal, but with a lot of hard work and commitment, and uh, working groups and panels and conversations after her conversations, we were able to get a bill done. While it's not perfect, certainly, it does make big strides towards that, which I would say is the centerpiece of the bill. Additionally, we have a strong foundation of equity that threads really throughout all the provisions of the bill. It was important to communities that we spoke with when crafting the original idea for the bill to see what actual real people wanted to see in their clean energy future. 
unlike energy pills of energy bills of past in Illinois, where they were crafted in the you know utility uh, conference rooms, we really wanted to get out in the community and have a conversation with people about what they wanted to see. And the answer across the board is we want clean energy to be a real part of uh, our communities. We wanted to integrate the conversation and make it part of our everyday lives. So we really uh, worked hard to make sure that equity, ensuring that everyone in Illinois could participate in a clean energy future was really a foundational piece of the bill. Um, and another uh, piece, and there's so much in it, but another piece that I think is, is very critical, especially to us in Illinois in light of current events, is a strong uh, suite of equity, uh, I'm sorry, accountability and um, ethics measures. Illinois is still involved, unfortunately, in a uh, scandal related to our biggest utility. And boy, I will tell you, negotiating an energy bill when that's going on is not easy. But it did uh, really serve as a driver for us to ensure we had very strong accountability provisions in the bill. That was something that was important to me personally, as well as many of my colleagues. And of course, the constituents. So those are just three examples of topics that are included that I think are very groundbreaking and nation leading. That is terrific to hear. Thank you so much for that. Um, you talked about equity and I think this um, bill as it was a bill and act now that it is, is become um, embedded in your, in your state's work um, really got a lot of recognition for stakeholder engagement in that equity piece. Um, and I wondered sort of beyond uh, maybe forums or opportunities to hear um, what various stakeholders concerns or interests were, what are the measures that are included in this act that are, are going to sort of directly benefit um, maybe particular communities or groups that have not benefited historically from energy policy? We do really work hard to make sure that equity is a consideration in every step of the process, no matter what we're doing, from reducing carbon to building up our renewable energy portfolio to EV infrastructure. We looked at every topic in terms of how it could be more inclusive and benefit communities traditionally left behind. So in terms of workforce and contract contractor development, uh, we focused our programs. We're going to invest uh, millions of dollars in equity focused communities. And we identified 13 hubs throughout the, still, uh, throughout the state of Illinois where we would really uh, hone in on uh, these communities and see where we could uh, institute these programs. So we have implemented minimum diversity and equity requirements for all renewable energy projects. And that's just something that hasn't been considered before. And we have dedicated support for disadvantaged contractors to participate in the clean energy economy. So we're not just creating jobs, although that's important, we're looking at opportunities to really build wealth. And that's where the contractor hubs and the incubator programs come into play. We have training programs for soon to be released people previously incarcerated. We create a green bank to finance clean energy projects and jobs and a program that really specifically focuses on EJ communities to provide seed capital. So we're going uh, far beyond just creating good paying jobs, although that is an important part of the bill as well. Very good. You also mentioned accountability measures. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about what those look like and also um, what kind of measures are included in the act to help uh, folks understand how this act is being implemented and, and which sort of pieces are going to be sort of near term or long term? Um, how do we know how it's working? Those are great questions. I'll start with the accountability question. In uh, light of the uh, massive federal investigation, this was top of mind for all of us as we move forward with the energy bill. As a, a, a start, we did not write this in, like I said, this was not written in the back rooms. This was not a wheeling and dealing sort of bill. This bill really uh, was very organically developed starting in communities. We had input from the environmental community, from faith-based faith -based organizations. Labor unions were a huge part of getting us to where the uh, we ended in terms of building a strong uh, 
bill that was going to create a lot of good paying jobs. Um, in terms of specific accountability measures for utilities, we do end formula rates. In Illinois, there were automatic rate increases built into the process where companies were rewarded simply for building and investing. And while we want to encourage investment, we want to make sure it's thoughtful and it's done in a way that benefits communities as a whole. So we are pushing and will be pushing uh, utilities to spend and invest in by using performance measures to uh, gauge that. So performance-based metrics include things like reliability, of course, resilience, which is what we're all talking about these days, equity, equity, affordability, and clean energy goals. So we are developing right now um, a series of accountability measures that we will be utilizing moving forward. So it's not just utilities, companies put money into a project and they're approved and the rates are raised accordingly. We actually are taking a step back and with the Illinois Commerce Commission, who is the regulatory body over the utilities, taking a good hard look at what these utility companies are doing to reach our climate goals, our equity goals, et cetera. Very good. Uh, you also talked about uh, coal phase outs in this legislation, and I think that's a, a topic that's sort of resonating across the country. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the negotiations for phasing out coal power plants unfolded? What were the considerations both um, for energy reliability and also maybe workforce opportunities? Well, there's a bit of a misconception that this bill and our efforts to address the climate crisis directly caused uh, coal plants to close. In Illinois, the plants were closing and are closing based on market forces. It was not something that was uh, starting with our legislation. It was something that we decided to address because if coal plants close for market reasons or suddenly leave a community, those communities are often devastated. They rely so heavily for uh, employment, for infrastructure, for revenue base taxes on those coal plants that when they close, the communities are really left in a lurch. Our goal was to include planning uh, for the closures and to have planned closures and organized closures so that we could support the communities as they transitioned. We call this our just transition. So one of the uh, hallmarks of this part of the bill is a grant program where nuclear or fossil fuel generators and mines that close will have grants available, will invest, invest in grants to support communities as they go through a transition. So eventually that will apply to nuclear plants. And right now it primarily addresses coal plants. We also created a displaced energy worker bill of rights for fossil fuel plant workers and creative incentives to transition to a different type of energy work. So we're hoping that the workers that were employed in the coal plants that close for whatever reason will be able to be retrained and take advantage of our vast programming related to a workforce development as well. And as these uh, sort of provisions in this act uh, unfold, what else are you thinking about in your committee on energy and environment? Well, you know, unfortunately we're not done. We can't check the box and say we've addressed this issue. Uh, addressing climate crisis and environmental issues is certainly an ongoing thing. You also asked about how we'll know if we are being successful. You know, traditionally we pass a big energy bill or a big gaming bill or a healthcare bill and then move on to the next item. I've worked hard in my committee to make sure that we are keeping legislators apprised of how things are going. We made a lot of um, sweeping commitments and they include things like providing these jobs, ensuring that we're um, doing this in an equitable way, providing accountability for utility companies. We want other you know, legislators, we want the public, we want these stakeholders to know we are monitoring the progress on all of these areas and more. And we are providing information directly to communities about implementation. This isn't a one day the bill passes, the next day it's implemented. There are workshops happening as we speak on many of these topics and uh, cases before the ICC that will determine really how the bill evolves. So while I'm sure we will need to revisit these issues, probably in the not too, distance fut not too distant future, um, we really are working hard to make sure that people 
this conversation continues and people are apprised as to how this is going and what we're doing and what we're looking to do next. And as you think about uh, the, the impact of this uh, CJ legislation, I wondered if you have done any kind of engagement with your neighbors across the Midwest or maybe across the country in thinking about um, how this legislation could be a model for other states um, or what you could learn from other states to continue this work. Well, I think it's a two-way street. We are uh, sharing information, but we are also gaining information for our, from our neighbors. Obviously, energy doesn't stop at the border. We do operate using the RTOs. So what's happening in our surrounding states is critical to how successful we are as a state. Um, in the future, while we're addressing the, pro uh, the power sector here, I think the conversations will continue in the EV space. We've done uh, some serious investment in EV infrastructure through CJA. We have worked on increasing uh, use of EVs in terms of transit, uh, school buses, things like that. But we've only really scratched the surface of what we can do with EVs. And, and EVs, again, you don't stop driving at the border of Illinois. This is a, a, a region-wide conversation as well. I would also say that um, transmission is a huge topic. We started talking about it in CJA, but obviously that's not something you can implement in a matter of days or months. Transmission really is a part of uh, what we are looking to do in CJA, we're calling uh, integrated grid planning. So rather than just have utility companies work in silos, we're looking at planning the grid based on a number of things, including um, need, peak demand, or what other states are doing, how our RTOs are faring in terms of energy procurement, things like that. So obviously energy has to be considered on the regional level and transmission, I think, is really the heart of that piece. Absolutely. Um... Uh, it seems to me as though Illinois has done a pretty good job investing in both uh, wind and solar, and I wondered if you are beginning to have conversations about other kinds of low carbon energy technologies. In particular, I'm thinking about hydrogen um, and energy storage, uh, maybe also the future of your nuclear fleet, um, and any other technologies that are on your radar. Well, just like anything, technology is really the key to um, you know unlocking you know potential here. Um, as far as the nuclear piece, I have some colleagues that are really interested in exploring some technologies that really have not been put in practice yet. So that's always something that we're thinking about. But hydrogen seems to be the topic du jour. I'm, uh, I think I have a call scheduled later this week to hear about some ideas in that space. There's one of my colleagues, Representative Howard from uh, the suburbs here, has started a hydrogen energy tax task force. So that will be taking a look at those issues in, a, in hopefully a new and innovative way. So I think that's the thing. No sooner do we pass the bill, whether it's on tech or healthcare or energy, and we're already looking at ways to uh, continue the conversation to address the advancing technology, which I think is a great thing. You know, it's hard for the law to keep up, but here technology really is leading. So the answer is yes. Terrific. I think um, we're, we're about out of time here. I wanted to end the conversation um, with a, a sort of request for your reflections on the kind of negotiations that were necessary to advance this um, CJA legislation. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I think there was a terrific amount of stakeholder engagement, but also negotiations big and small. And I wondered, um, what do you think made that successful? And, and what should other states be thinking about when they try and engage on some of these topics? Well, I love thinking about it, especially now that it's over, <laughs> at least that part of it, because it was a lot of work. It really was quite a roller coaster ride. I mean, it really depended on the day, week, sometimes hour, how we felt about the legislation and its success. But I would say at the core, um, you know, we had stakeholders, as you mentioned, we had a myriad of stakeholders. I think one conference call had 85 people on it. That was in the early days before we got a smaller room to actually do the bill. But, you know, I think the key for me was really the grassroots engagement. And that was, it started with the conversations I referenced in the beginning about um, 
going into communities and getting their uh, feedback on what they wanted to have their energy future look like. Because once the grassroots got involved, they could get excited about the bill. And certainly people care about the climate crisis. Uh, young people were a huge part of the grassroots movement. And the more energy and engagement we had from the grassroots, the more legislators would hear about the bill and the more they would be invested and engaged in the process and the more likely it is that we would get our goals met. So having that that piece at the beginning uh, really helped turn CJA into a household acronym, uh, I would say. My colleagues all knew about CJA. They'd be hearing about it at every turn and sometimes would roll their eyes and say, okay, Ann, what's going on with CJA? I've gotten you know, 20 calls in the last hour about it. Can, what can you tell me? And they would focus on an area that might be of particular interest to them. So that really enabled the negotiations to move forward, having individual legislators involved in the conversation, whatever their angle might be. Some were very focused on the EV space. Others were concerned about job creation. Uh, voters in my district wanted to hear what was our solution to, at least on the state level, what could we contribute to the climate crisis conversation? So it depended on where you represented to, to as to what the priorities were. But again, having it kind of a bottom up conversation, I think was really critical to getting it passed and to getting it to be kind of the issue that everyone was talking about at that time and ultimately led, it, ultimately led us to get the bill passed. Well, congratulations. You certainly did a great job there. Thank you so much for your time, Re Representative Williams. We really enjoyed having you. Um, I hope that our audience can tune in tomorrow for a conversation with Oregon and on Thursday for conversations from uh, a leader in New Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us, Representative Williams. Thank you for having me.